Hey, you found us. Welcome, everybody. This is Scripture Gems. Hello, and welcome to the show. My name is John Fulmer, and this is my brother Jay. How's it going, John? We are two brothers who just can't get enough of the scriptures. Yeah, we love them. This episode, we are going over the Come Follow Me lesson for August 16th through 22nd, 2021. This is covering Doctrine and Covenants sections 89 through 92. And now let's bring out the star of the show, the scriptures. Oh, this wow. is going to be fantastic. And now let's consult the Scripturematic 6000 to find out how long it will take to read this week's reading. 14 minutes, 37 seconds. Easy peasy. And what would that be daily? Two minutes, five seconds. So easy and so much fun, the reading this week. We've got time codes here if you want to study it section by section. Otherwise, let's buckle up and get started. Here we've got the visuals of where the different revelations have taken place. But now let's get on right away into section 89. Have you ever had to explain to someone why you do not drink alcohol or tea or coffee or use tobacco? What did you say? How did they respond? I know I've had that experience. This word of wisdom makes us very distinct in the world of Christianity. And many friends have been curious and puzzled as to why that commandment. We are going to talk about the section, of course, but there is so much amazing background information in Revelations in Context. Yes, read that. This is a particularly good article. Now, we will read some of it, but read all of it. We could say we're going to read a lot of it, but there's still more. We had to trim it down, of course, for the show, but you're going to be amazed. We were And so, check it out. Let's get started. Revelations in Context, Word of Wisdom. Here we go. Like many other revelations in the early church, Doctrine and Covenants 89, also known today as the Word of Wisdom, came in response to a problem. In Kirtland, many men in the church were called to preach in various parts of the United States. They were to cry repentance unto the people and gather in the Lord's elect. To prepare these recent converts for their important labors, Joseph Smith started a training school called the School of the Prophets, which opened in Kirtland on the second floor of the Newell K. Whitney Mercantile Store in January 1833. Now, you remember we talked about that in our last lesson. Exactly. Every morning after breakfast, the men met in the school to hear instruction from Joseph Smith. The room was very small, and about 25 elders packed the space. The first thing they did after sitting down was light a pipe and begin to talk about the great things of the kingdom and puff away, Brigham Young recounted. The clouds of smoke were so thick the men could hardly even see Joseph through the haze. Once the pipes were smoked out, they would then put in a chew on one side and perhaps on both sides, and then it was all over the floor. All right, now after that account, Let me just explain chewing tobacco if you aren't aware of chewing tobacco. It's a smokeless tobacco. That's a dried tobacco leaf. You put it in your mouth between your cheek and your gums, either on one side or on both sides. And as the tobacco sits there and as you kind of suck on it, the nicotine comes into your bloodstream through the gums. But you don't want to swallow the juice. So you have to get rid of it. So you spit it. And in this case, it was very common for people to just spit that gross saliva tobacco juice onto the floor. Continuing on, in this dingy setting, Joseph Smith attempted to teach the men how they and their converts should become holy without spot and worthy of the presence of God. Hmm. So let's take a look at the Lord's answer in section 89. Start with verse 1. A word of wisdom for the benefit of the Council of High Priests assembled in Kirtland and the Church and also the saints in Zion to be sent greeting, not by commandment or constraint, but by revelation and the word of wisdom, showing forth the order and will of God in the temporal salvation of all saints in the last days. So, interesting note. From the seminary manual, we have a quote from President Joseph F. Smith where he talks a little bit more about that phrase, not by commandment or constraint. This is from the October 1913 General Conference. He says, quote, If the word of wisdom had been given as a commandment, 
it would have brought every man addicted to the use of these noxious things under condemnation. So the Lord was merciful and gave them a chance to overcome before he brought them under the law. End quote. Very true. Also from the seminary manual, it gives this summary. Throughout the early history of the church, leaders invited the saints to more fully live the word of wisdom. In the fall general conference of 1851, Brigham Young proposed that all saints formally covenant to abstain from tea, coffee, tobacco, and whiskey. On October 13, 1882, the Lord revealed to President John Taylor that the word of wisdom was to be considered a commandment. In 1919, the First Presidency under President Heber J. Grant made the observance of the word of wisdom a requirement for receiving a temple recommend. Now, I don't want to go too deep in the woods on this, but I've spoken with many people who struggle with the word of wisdom, and they will often justify their position by quoting verse 2 and saying, it's not by commandment or constraint. Strangely enough, it's almost always about justifying the drinking of coffee. Interesting. This is an interesting pattern. It would seem that most people today don't need any further counsel on the dangers of alcohol and tobacco, but coffee's the struggle. Hmm. So just a few thoughts on that. One, who is the authority in this scenario? And really any scenario. Is it the Doctrine and Covenants? Is it Joseph Smith? Is it Heber J. Grant? Or is it Jesus Christ? This is not about correctly interpreting the written word. The word is not the authority, unless you capitalize word, right? <laughs> right, yes. John chapter 1. Uh-huh. President George Q. Cannon has a quote that I really love where he says, quote, We have the Bible, the Book of Mormon, and the Book of Doctrine and Covenants, but all these books without the living oracles and a constant stream of revelation from the Lord would not lead any people into the celestial kingdom, end quote. That's from a compilation of his quotes, Gospel Truth, Discourses, and Writings of George Buchanan. President Grant received direct revelation from Jesus Christ, the authority to make the word of wisdom a requirement for temple recommends. Was Heber J. Grant not a prophet of God? And this is not without precedent, too. We've talked about this on the show multiple times this year, but also in our Book of Mormon year, Church policies change over time, building line upon line, precept upon precept. There are examples of these kinds of transitions, some very major, throughout every volume of Scripture we have. Yeah, such a good point about line upon line. This is about trying to get us to become something divine. Sometimes it starts with small steps, but the Lord expects a lot of us. Let's go on with verse 3. Given for a principle with promise. I love that phrase. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Going on. Adapted to the capacity of the weak and the weakest of all saints, who are or can be called saints. Behold, verily thus saith the Lord unto you, in consequence of evils and designs which do and will exist in the hearts of conspiring men in the last days, I have warned you and forewarn you by giving unto you this word of wisdom by revelation. The Institute Manual has a quote from Elder Boyd K. Packer of the Quorum of the Twelve, who described how the Word of Wisdom embodies specific principles that we can use to guide our decisions. Quote, The Word of Wisdom was given for a principle with promise. That word, principle, in the Revelation is a very important one. A principle is an enduring truth, a law, a rule you can adopt to guide you in making decisions. Generally, principles are not spelled out in detail. That leaves you free to find your way with an enduring truth, a principle, as your anchor. Members write in asking if this thing or that is against the word of wisdom. It's well known that tea, coffee, liquor, and tobacco are against it. It has not been spelled out in more detail. Rather, we teach the principle together with the promised blessings— there are many habit-forming addictive things that one can drink or chew or inhale or inject which injure both body and spirit, which are not mentioned in the Revelation. Everything harmful is not specifically listed. Arsenic, for instance, certainly bad, but not habit-forming. <laughs> thought that was a good joke. Yep. He who must be commanded in all things, the Lord said, is a slothful 
and not a wise servant. And this is from the April 1996 General Conference. Amen. Thank you, President Packer. Mm -hmm. Now, I wanted to mention something, too, about this principle with a promise, that it's adapted to the capacity of the weak and the weakest of all saints. Is it okay if, and I'm just offering this as an if, if we're commanded to live the word of wisdom because there are those who, for this commandment, are very weak in their ability to resist, is it okay that we all live a commandment if it really is just meant to help a few? And I'm not saying that's necessarily true, but it's an interesting distinction that he gives there for the capacity of the weak and weakest. So you're suggesting the idea that maybe some people could have, say, a drink of alcohol and not have that affect them, but others, it would drive them to an addiction very quickly. Exactly. And so this is to accommodate the weakest of all. And yet we're all asked to live it. And there's no doubt this commandment is a blessing to all of us. But I'm compelled by the example of Paul when he counsels the people in Corinth. This is in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. The people are apparently are asking if it's okay to eat meat sacrificed to idols. And he says, why is this even a question? It's obvious that the idols are nothing. They're no God. Therefore, the meat sacrificed to them, there's nothing special about it. And so... Technically, there's not a problem. But in verse 9, he offers this caution. He says, but take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours, and here he's referring to eating meat sacrificed to idols, this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. Well, what does he mean? Well, he goes on in verse 10 to say, if any man see thee, which has knowledge, meaning who's a Christian, if he sees you sit at meat in the idol's temple, Shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? In other words, if you've got a member who's not as strong in the gospel, his faith isn't as strong, he sees you and he misinterprets what you're doing, that could be a problem. He says that essentially through your example, even though what you're doing isn't technically wrong, but it gives the wrong impression that that could cause a weak brother to perish. But he says in verse 12, But when ye sin so against the brethren, and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. Wherefore, and this is the part I really love, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. Wow. Think about that attitude. Think about that sense that If I do something that even creates the appearance of evil that could cause a weak saint to lose their testimony or to fall from the faith of Christ, why would I even think about it? Why would I be so selfish? Now, if you're thinking this, I get it. We can't control what everybody thinks and whatnot. But I think you know what Paul's saying here. We can pay attention to things. We can do things or give up things that can help other people when they're having a hard time. If giving up the word of wisdom things will bless those that are weaker, then why wouldn't we do it? And will it be a blessing for us? No doubt. It's a principle with a promise. But in the church, it's not just about us and our capacity. We are trying to be one. And to do that, we can reach out and help people, even if it's not something we specifically have a problem with. Remember what this commandment is talking about, or this word of wisdom. It's something the Lord is giving us because of the evil designs in the last days. It's specific for us in the last days. And therefore, he warns us not to use these substances. And speaking of evil designs, from the Institute Manual, we get a great quote from President Ezra Taft Benson. This is coming from April 1983 General Conference, where he warns us, quote, The Lord foresaw the situation of today. When motives for money would cause men to conspire to entice others to take noxious substances into their bodies, advertisements which promote beer, wine, liquors, coffee, tobacco, and other harmful substances are examples of what the Lord foresaw. But the most pernicious example of an evil conspiracy in our time is those who induce young people into the use of drugs. My young brothers and sisters, in all love... We give you warning that Satan and his emissaries will strive to entice you to use harmful substances because they well know if you partake, 
your spiritual powers will be inhibited and you will be in their evil power. Stay away from those places or people which would influence you to break the commandments of God. Keep the commandments of God and you will have the wisdom to know and discern that which is evil. End quote. Wonderful. Love that. So let's take a look at some of the items that we're warned against in verses 5 through 9. The first couple of verses, 5, 6, and 7, I guess that's 3, talks about strong drinks. Let's turn to Revelations in context for some background. Francis Trelope, a British novelist, reported disdainfully in 1832 that in all her recent travels in the United States, she hardly ever met a man who was not either a tobacco chewer or a whiskey drinker. The American Revolution only exacerbated this reliance on alcohol. After molasses imports like rum were cut off, Americans sought a substitute for rum by turning to whiskey. Grain farmers in western Pennsylvania and Tennessee found it cheaper to manufacture whiskey than to ship and sell perishable grains. As a consequence, the number of distilleries grew rapidly after 1780, boosted by settlement of the Corn Belt in Kentucky and Ohio and the vast distances to eastern markets. To the astonishment of observers like Trelope, Americans everywhere, men, women, and children, drank whiskey all day long. American consumption of distilled spirits climbed precipitously from two and a half gallons per person per year in 1790 to seven gallons in 1830, the highest amount of any time in American history, and a figure three times today's consumption rate. And by the way, that's just hard liquors. It's to say nothing of beer or hard ciders. Just remarkable. Going on in the article, this elevated alcohol consumption offended religious sensibilities. Alcohol became viewed more as a dangerous tempter and less as a gift from God. The idea of full abstinence from alcoholic beverages soon became a central plank in the American Temperance Society. ATS, organized in Boston in 1826. Members of the organization were encouraged to sign a temperance pledge, not just to moderate their alcohol intake, but to abstain altogether. A capital T was written next to the names of those who did so, and from this the word teetotaler was derived. By the mid-1830s, the ATS had grown to well over a million members, many of them teetotalers. And that's not a word that we use very often, but I think we should. I think so, too. Let's bring it back. I'm a teetotaler. I am. I'm too. (laughs) Ain't you ashamed? Intoxicated. Oh, that's ridiculous. I'm a tea. I'll say I'm a teetotaler. Yeah. Going on in the article. Encouraged by the ATS, local temperance societies popped up by the thousands across the U.S. countryside. Kirtland had its own temperance society, as did many small towns. Precisely because alcohol reform was so often discussed and debated, the saints needed a way of adjudicating which opinions were right. Therefore, the word of wisdom stated, Inasmuch as any man drinketh wine or strong drink among you, behold, it is not good, neither meat in the sight of your father. The term strong drink certainly included distilled spirits such as whiskey, which thereafter the Latter-day Saints generally shunned, they took a more moderate approach to milder alcoholic beverages like beer and pure wine of the grape of the vine of your own make. For the next two generations, Latter-day Saint leaders taught the word of wisdom as a command from God, but they tolerated a variety of viewpoints on how strictly the commandment should be observed. This incubation period gave the saints time to develop their own tradition of abstinence from habit-forming substances. Now let's look on in verses 8 and 9. Here we get the discussion of tobacco. Let's go back to the revelations in context. This episode in the Whitney store occurred in the middle of a massive transformation within Western culture. Tobacco spitting shifted from being a publicly acceptable practice among most segments of the population to becoming seen as a filthy habit beneath the dignity of polite society. In the midst of this cultural shift, at the very moment when everyday people started to concern themselves with their own cleanliness and bodily health, the word of wisdom arrived to light the way. 
The scene in School of the Prophets would have been enough to give any non-tobacco user like Joseph Smith cause for concern. Joseph's wife, Emma, told him that the environment concerned her. He and Emma lived in the Whitney store, and the task of scrubbing the spittle from the hardwood fell upon her. Oh, gross. She may have complained of being asked to perform this thankless task, but there was also a more practical consideration— She could not make the floor look decent, Brigham Young recalled. The stains were impossible to get out. The whole situation seemed less than ideal for those who were called of God as these elders were, especially when we remember that the room with the filthy floor was Joseph's translation room, the same place where he received revelations in the name of God. Joseph began inquiring of the Lord about what could be done, and on February 27th, Scarcely a month after the school started, he received the revelation later canonized as Doctrine and Covenants 89. The answer was unequivocal. Tobacco is not for man, but is for bruises and all sick cattle to be used with judgment and skill. Nice. In verse 9, we've got hot drinks. Back to Revelations in Context. American temperance reformers succeeded in the 1830s in no small part by identifying a substitute for alcohol, coffee. In the 18th century, coffee was considered a luxury item, and British manufactured tea was much preferred. After the Revolution, tea drinking came to be seen as unpatriotic and largely fell out of favor. The way was open for a rival stimulant to emerge. In 1830, reformers persuaded the U.S. Congress to remove the import duty on coffee. The strategy worked. Coffee fell to 10 cents a pound, making a cup of coffee the same price as a cup of whiskey, marking whiskey's decline. By 1833, coffee had entered largely into the daily consumption of almost every family, rich and poor. The word of wisdom rejected the idea of a substitute for alcohol. Hot drinks, which Latter-day Saints understood to mean coffee and tea, are not for the body or belly, the Revelation explained. Now, if you want a specific reference of what hot drinks refers to, the Institute Manual offers this. The Prophet Joseph Smith and Hiram Smith were reported to have specifically identified coffee and tea as the hot drinks mentioned in the Word of Wisdom. And President Brigham Young later confirmed this explanation. And if you are interested, there's a source here. This is from the June 1st, 1842 Times and Seasons. This is the issue where Hiram Smith gives that assertion and clarification. Mm. And that's been clarified a few times in official church statements. Tea would be any beverage, hot or cold, that is made from the tea leaf. So this would include green tea. Black tea is actually the same tea leaf, but the leaf has been fermented. Iced tea. And for Star Trek, the next generation fans, Earl Grey is black tea with bergamot oil. So still tea. What a strange bit of trivia. Yes. Coffee would include any food item with coffee in it. So look for key words like mocha, latte, espresso, or anything ending in chino. That advice comes from an August 2019 New Era article that I'll talk about in a minute. In Italian, the suffix chino means little or sweet, so I'm sure someone will write in with an exception to this rule. But it gives us a good basis for what to look for. Mm -hmm. Herbal teas, hot chocolate, and so forth, they're not on the list. Not included. Yeah, but what if I wanted to get me some kind of a Coca-Cola drink? So a drink with caffeine in it? (laughs) Do we want to get into the caffeine controversy? I think we do. We probably should. You know, in preparing for this lesson, I did a little research on this, and I was fascinated to see that this controversy of whether or not caffeine violates the word of wisdom is over 100 years old. Amazing. In 1918, Dr. Frederick J. Pack, a professor at the University of Utah and member of the church, published an article called Should Latter-day Saints Drink Coca-Cola in the March 1918 Improvement Era? Now, the Improvement Era was the official publication of the church, the magazine of the church. It predates the Enzyme, or today the Liahona. He reasoned that because Coca-Cola contained caffeine, which is also present in tea and coffee, Mormons should abstain from Coca-Cola in the same way. 
This caused a fair amount of confusion throughout much of the 20th century and probably even still today. In the mid-1950s, the director of food services at BYU decided not to sell caffeinated beverages on campus. Now, since then, this issue has been clarified several times. For example, in the second half of the 20th century before the days of official church handbooks, the Correlation Department of the Church would occasionally circulate a publication called the Priesthood Bulletin with updates to church policy. In February 1972, President Joseph Fielding Smith, along with President Harold B. Lee and President N. Eldon Tanner, released this statement, quote, With reference to cola drinks, the church has never officially taken a position on this matter. But the leaders of the church have advised, and we do now specifically advise, against the use of any drink containing harmful habit-forming drugs under circumstances that would result in acquiring the habit. Any beverage that contains ingredients harmful to the body should be avoided, end quote. Incidentally, the BYU policy on caffeinated beverages changed just recently in September 2017. Caffeinated beverages are now sold on campus. So I mentioned earlier a reference to an article in the New Era, August 2019. The article is titled, Vaping, Coffee, Tea, and Marijuana. This article clarified that vaping or using e-cigarettes are a violation of the word of wisdom, as well as the use of marijuana or opioids unless used for medicinal purposes as prescribed by a competent physician. Now, this is a great article, and the link we're going to include to it is from the church's newsroom, and it indicates that this is the official position of the church on this issue. So you can take a look at it if you'd like. It's a great thing to read with your kids if you've got kids around. Let's go on with verse 10, because there's more than just what we shouldn't partake of. Verse 10, And again, verily I say unto you, all wholesome herbs God hath ordained for the constitution, nature, and use of man. Every herb in the season thereof, and every fruit in the season thereof, all these to be used with prudence and thanksgiving. A note back in Revelations in context, the revelation encouraged the consumption of basic staples of the kind that had sustained life for millennia. The revelation praised all wholesome herbs and explained that all grain is for the use of man and of beasts to be the staff of life, as also the fruit of the vine, that which beareth fruit, whether in the ground or above ground. In keeping with an earlier revelation endorsing the eating of meat, the word of wisdom reminded the saints that the flesh of beasts and fowls was given for the use of man with thanksgiving, but added the caution that meat was to be used sparingly and not to excess. So let's take a look at the promise portion of this revelation. As my favorite part. Yes, the principle with the promise. Mm -hmm. Verse 18. And all saints who remember to keep and do these sayings, walking in obedience to the commandments, shall receive health in their navel and marrow to their bones, and shall find wisdom and great treasures of knowledge, even hidden treasures, and shall run and not be weary, and shall walk and not faint. And I, the Lord, give unto them a promise that the destroying angels shall pass by them as the children of Israel and not slay them. Amen. Now, that has reference to the Passover story that we'll actually talk about in more detail next year when we cover the book of Exodus. I suspect that each one of you have a story about the word of wisdom, either with yourself or with people that you know, and the blessings that have come from living it. I remember a family on my mission who had suffered a great loss, and when I was invited to come and teach the gospel as a young missionary, everything that the word of wisdom warns us about was being consumed. As we worked with them and as they made changes in their lives, the blessings that we just talked about in these verses became so prevalent, so clear. It was amazing to watch the transformation. I testify that this promise is true. I've seen it. I've experienced it. It's an amazing commandment. And what a great promise. And to go along with what Jay was talking about, from the seminary manual, we have a quote from President Boyd K. Packer from the October 1979 General Conference. 
in which he says, quote, I have come to know that a fundamental purpose of the word of wisdom has to do with revelation. If someone under the influence can hardly listen to plain talk, how can they respond to spiritual promptings that touch their most delicate feelings? As valuable as the word of wisdom is as a law of health, it may be much more valuable to you spiritually than it is physically, end quote. Great point. You know, that reminds me of a story that I had heard once. There was a man serving as a bishop who had a member of his congregation anxious to justify her drinking of coffee. They were at a Temple Recommend interview, and this woman confessed to having an occasional cup of coffee. And she would say, now, Bishop, are you telling me that you believe that this one cup of coffee would keep me from being in the celestial kingdom? To which you replied, no, but that attitude will. Yeah, that's true for everything, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah, you might remember from our last lesson on Doctrine and Covenants 88, 88 verse 35, this is someone seeking to be a law unto themselves. That's a problem. Yeah, that is. Remember who our Lord is. Yep, and who we are. Yeah. So going back to Jay's question at the beginning of the lesson, Jay and I grew up in Wisconsin, and due to the heavily German heritage, beer is plentiful. We've both been asked why we don't drink beer or alcohol. We should be careful not to attempt to explain or justify the answer. In other words, say, I don't drink alcohol because it's bad for me, or I don't smoke because it causes lung cancer. We've never really been given a, we do this because. For me, my answer is simple. I don't partake of these things because my Heavenly Father asked me not to, and I promised him I would not. Yeah, you know, on my mission in particular, I always tried to justify these things. Well, this is bad, or this has got this, or whatever. That's hardly the point. Because what if science comes out and says, well, a glass of red wine a day is very good for you? That's not relevant. For me, I would say I've made a covenant with God that I would not partake of these things, and he has blessed me for keeping my promise. And that is absolutely true. Yeah. And then somebody can't come back and say, well, what about this? What about this? That's not relevant. It's about making a covenant with God. Keep in mind that the law of health that God has given today isn't necessarily the law of health that was given in the past. In the days of the law of Moses, they couldn't have bacon. They got wine, but they didn't get bacon. For us, we don't get wine, but we get bacon. And see, that was a hard time. (laughs) I couldn't imagine struggling through that. That was. I would rather have bacon. Yes. But the point is, it's not relevant even what's in there. Now, we know about dangers and so forth, but that's hardly the point. God has given us this list and said, if you don't partake of these things and do partake of these things, here are the blessings. And we make a covenant with him that will do it. And he makes a covenant with us that he'll bless us. So that, to me, is at the core of the issue. Let's take a look at Revelations in context as we wrap up this section. It says, Soon after receiving the word of wisdom, Joseph Smith appeared before the elders of the school of the prophets and read the revelation to them. The brethren did not have to be told what the words meant. They immediately threw their tobacco pipes into the fire, one of the participants in the school recalled. Since that time, the inspiration in the word of wisdom has been proven many times over in the lives of the saints its power and divinity cascading down through the years. In some ways, the American health reform movement has faded from view. The word of wisdom remains to light our way. So grateful for the word of wisdom. As a cherry on top, let me share a story from NPR News. This was from April 2021. It mentioned that in South Africa, the government had outlawed alcohol and shut down bars prior to and as part of the lockdowns for COVID-19. The idea was that if they can stop alcohol, then people will stop gathering together and it would help prevent the spread of the disease. The article says there was an immediate public health benefit that had nothing to do with COVID-19. Suddenly, emergency rooms were empty devoid of alcohol-related accidents. So it was fascinating what we can look at to see the effect that these things can have when we just stop. Absolutely. Well, let's go on to Section 90. Welcome to Section 90. Happy to be here. From the Seminary Manual, we get this summary. 
On March 8, 1833, the Lord gave the revelation recorded in Doctrine and Covenants 90. This revelation contains instructions to the presidency of the high priesthood and was a continuing step in the development of the first presidency. So let's take a little journey to discover the development of the first presidency. From the Institute Manual, In April 1830, the Prophet Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery were sustained as the first elder and the second elder of the church. At that time, the Lord did not implement the organizational structure of the church that we are familiar with today. In November 1831, a revelation instructed the saints that it must needs be that one be appointed of the high priesthood to preside over the priesthood, and he shall be called president of the high priesthood of the church. In a conference held in Amherst, Ohio in January 1832, Joseph Smith was ordained as the president of the high priesthood in fulfillment of that divine instruction. Then, on March 8, 1832, Joseph Smith called Jesse Goss and Sidney Rigdon to serve as his counselors in the presidency of the high priesthood. Jesse Goss did not remain faithful, however, and the Lord called Frederick G. Williams to take Brother Goss's place in the presidency on January 5, 1833. On March 8, 1833, the Lord clarified that Sidney Rigdon and Frederick G. Williams were to be equal with the church president in holding the keys of this last kingdom. They were subsequently ordained as counselors in the presidency of the high priesthood on March 18, 1833. By 1835, the presidency of the high priesthood became known as the First Presidency. Awesome. All right, well, let's get into the revelations. Let's start in verse 2. Therefore thou art blessed from henceforth that bear the keys of the kingdom given unto you, which kingdom is coming forth for the last time. Verily I say unto you, the keys of this kingdom shall never be taken from you, while thou art in the world, neither in the world to come. Now, just to clarify, the keys of the kingdom means the rights of the presidency or the power God gives man to govern and direct his kingdom on the earth. Going on in verse 4, Nevertheless, through you shall the oracles be given to another, yea, even unto the church. Let me clarify oracles for a minute. Oracles refers to revelations from God through his prophets. Going on in verse 5, And all they who receive the oracles of God Let them beware how they hold them, lest they are accounted as a light thing, and are brought under condemnation thereby, and stumble, and fall, when the storms descend, and the winds blow, and the rains descend, and beat upon their house. So think about that for a minute. What do you think it means to treat the revelations of God as a light thing? As you think about that, Can you think of revelations that we might be tempted to treat lightly? An interesting discussion to have. Now, from the Institute Manual, I found a really neat quote that is a testimony of the lineage of the priesthood powers in the church. This comes from President Gordon B. Hinckley from April 1981 General Conference, where he says, quote, That same authority which Joseph held Those same keys and powers, which were the very essence of his divinely given right to preside, were by him conferred upon the twelve apostles with Brigham Young at their head. Every president of the church since then has come to that most high and sacred office out of the council of the twelve. Each of these men has been blessed with the spirit and power of revelation from on high. There has been an unbroken chain from Joseph Smith, Jr. to the current prophet. Of that I bear solemn witness and testimony before you this day. End quote. Wonderful. Love that. Now, we looked at verse 6 already in our introduction. Sidney Rigdon and Frederick G. Williams were to be equal with the church president in holding the keys of this last kingdom. Now, you might remember that when we studied Doctrine and Covenants 81, we talked about the calling of... (laughs) That's that's right, we did. (laughs) Let's talk about that a little bit more, this idea of counselors being equal with the president. 
From the Institute Manual, Elder John A. Widsow of the Quorum of the Twelve explained that in the revelation recorded in Doctrine and Covenants section 90, quote, the preeminence of the president of the church was maintained. The question as to whether the counselors held the same power as the president was soon debated among the people. What could the counselors do without direct appointment from the president? These questions were answered in a meeting on January 16, 1836. The prophet there said, The twelve are not subject to any other than the first presidency. And where I am not, there is no first presidency over the twelve. In other words, were the president taken, the counselors would have no authority. The counselors do not possess the power of the president and cannot act in church matters without direction and consent of the president. You know, that relationship was explained in even greater detail with President Gordon B. Hinckley. There's a soft spot in my heart for President Hinckley, and this particular story I thought was particularly meaningful. This comes from October 1990 General Conference. He says, quote, In some circumstances, a counselor may serve as a proxy for his president. The power of proxy must be granted by the president, and it must never be abused by the counselor. The work must go forward, notwithstanding absences of the president, for reasons of illness, employment, or other factors beyond his control. In these circumstances and in the interest of the work, the president should give his counselors authority to act with full confidence, he having trained them as they have served together as a bishopric or presidency. During the time that President Kimball was ill, President Tanner's health failed and he passed away. President Romney was called as first counselor and I as second counselor to President Kimball. Then President Romney became ill, thus leaving me an almost overwhelming burden of responsibility. I counseled frequently with my brethren of the Twelve, and I cannot say enough of appreciation to them for their understanding and for the wisdom of their judgment. In matters where there was a well-established policy, we moved forward. But no new policy was announced or implemented, and no significant practice was altered without sitting down with President Kimball and laying the matter before him and receiving his full consent and full approval. President Benson is now 91 years of age and does not have the strength or vitality he once possessed in abundance. Brother Monson and I, as his counselors, do as has been done before and that is to move forward the work of the church while being very careful not to get ahead of the president nor to undertake any departure of any kind from long-established policy without his knowledge and full approval, End quote. That's a wonderful perspective. I love that. Let's look ahead in verses 7 through 10. The first presidency was instructed to prepare the members of the school of the prophets to preach the gospel throughout the world, and in verse 11, it says, For it shall come to pass in that day that every man shall hear the fullness of the gospel in his own tongue and in his own language through those who are ordained unto this power by the administration of the Comforter shed forth upon them for the revelation of Jesus Christ. Can you imagine what an amazing promise that was for such a small church? Wow. In verses 12 through 18, the prophet Joseph Smith and his counselors were to set in order the affairs of the church. In verse 13, we have that after the work of translation, they are to preside over the affairs of the church and the school. In verse 14, that through revelation, they are to unfold the mysteries of the kingdom. They are to set in order the churches and study and learn in verse 15. And in verses 17 through 18, to improve themselves, including the admonition to set their houses in in order. Starting in verse 19, this contains the Lord's instructions to early church leaders on how to handle the difficult circumstances they faced. At the time, Joseph and other church leaders were in a difficult situation because of the church's lack of financial resources. What comfort and help can the words of verse 24 give us when we struggle? Let's take a look. Verse 24, search diligently, pray always, and be believing, and all things shall work together for your good, 
if ye walk uprightly, and remember the covenant wherewith ye have covenanted one with another. Now, this idea was cemented even further in a quote from Elder Jeffrey R. Holland that we found in the Institute Manual. This is from October 2008 General Conference. He says, quote, We are to search diligently, pray always, and be believing. Then all things shall work together for our good, if we walk uprightly and remember the covenant wherewith we have covenanted. The latter days are not a time to fear and tremble. They are a time to be believing and remember our covenants, end quote. Fantastic. A beautiful perspective. It is. There's somebody who inspires me as an example of just the kinds of traits that verse 24 is referring to. This is one of only two women mentioned by name in the Doctrine and Covenants. Her name is Vienna Jacques, and the Lord speaks directly to her, starting in verse 28. Let's take a look at that. Verse 28, And again, Verily I say unto you, It is my will that my handmaid Vienna Jacques should receive money to bear her expenses and go up unto the land of Zion, and the residue of the money may be consecrated unto me, and she be rewarded in mine own due time. Verily I say unto you that it is meet in mine eyes that she should go up unto the land of Zion and receive an inheritance from the hand of the bishop, that she may settle down in peace, inasmuch as she is faithful, and not be idle in her days from thenceforth. (laughs) I don't think there's much of a chance of that if you know anything about Vienna Jacques. In case you're unfamiliar with her story, here's a sampling. And take a look if you see also the characteristics described in verse 24 manifested in her life. From the Institute Manual, it summarizes the beginning of her life this way. She was born June 10th, 1787. After she met the missionaries in Boston, Massachusetts, she traveled to Kirtland, Ohio in 1831. She stayed there six weeks and was baptized. Upon returning to Boston, Vienna was active in missionary work, helping to bring several members of her family into the church and help the missionaries establish a small branch of the church there. She then settled up her business and went back to Kirtland to unite her interests forever with the church. In 1833, Vienna donated a substantial amount of money to the church during a time when the money was desperately needed to purchase land in Kirtland, including land for the temple, and in Missouri. On March 8, 1833, the Prophet Joseph Smith received a revelation directing her to go up unto the land of Zion, Missouri, and receive an inheritance. She traveled to Missouri, But soon after she arrived, she suffered persecution with the saints there. In June 1834, when the company of Zion's camp was stricken with cholera, she was among those who helped attend to the sick. Heber C. Kimball wrote, I received great kindness from them and also from Sister Vienna Jacques, who administered to my wants and also to my brethren. May the Lord reward them for their kindness. With the other saints in Missouri, Sister Jacques was driven from her home to Nauvoo, Illinois. She eventually traveled west to Utah in 1847, and at the age of 60, drove her own wagon across the plains. She settled in Salt Lake City and for the rest of her life worked hard to support herself and diligently study the scriptures. Vienna died on February 7, 1884, at the age of 96. One remembrance written about her stated, She was true to her covenants and esteemed the restoration of the gospel as a priceless treasure. What an amazing tribute. Yeah, and she's so incredible. As a matter of fact, if you think about the major episodes of the church, she seems to always be there. You know, Zion's camp was mentioned, but she also was at the very first baptism for the dead. As a matter of fact, she and her horse were the two witnesses for the very first baptism for the dead that was performed. You can read about that in the church history topics on baptism for the dead. So it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, she's there at Nauvoo. She's in Kirtland. She's at the temple. She's there for the endowments, you know, Zion's camp. She's going out west. It seems like every major event finds her someplace in there. It wouldn't surprise me if she happened to be strolling in the sacred grove, you know, when Joseph was a teenager. (laughs) What's amazing about her is she's unconventional. 
This is a middle-aged single sister when she begins this journey. And I encourage you to learn more about her. She is wonderful. This is a fair summary, but there's so much more. There's an article by the Church History Department's very own Brent M. Rogers. It's in the June 2016 Enzyme called Vienna Jacques, Woman of Faith, and we'll link it there. But one of my favorite stories about her is referenced in the beginning of this article. However, I like the way that the Saints book tells it better. It's a more complete version. So I would point you that direction. It's an incident that happened on July 20th, 1833, when the mob in Missouri destroyed the printing press where the Book of Commandments was being published. The mob had also attacked Charles Allen and Bishop Edward Partridge, covering them with tar, which burned, eating away at their skin like acid and topped off the humiliation by covering the tar with feathers. This is from the book Saints, Volume 1, page 180. Nearby, a convert named Vienna Jacques was collecting scattered pages from the Book of Commandments off the street. I have to just take a break here. Can you just imagine that? We just had a mob go through. They're violent. They're destroying things. They've tarred and feathered these people. And where's Vienna Jacques? Not hiding, not running. She's right there in the midst of it collecting these precious pages of the Book of Commandments. Going on with the story. Vienna had consecrated her considerable savings to help build up Zion, and now everything was falling apart. As she clutched the loose pages, a man from the mob came up to her and said, This is only a prelude of what you have to suffer. He pointed to Edward's haggard figure. There goes your bishop, tarred and feathered. Vienna looked up and saw Edward limping away. Only his face and the palms of his hands were not covered in tar. And look at this response. Glory to God, she exclaimed. He will receive a crown of glory for tar and feathers. Mm. (laughs) What an amazing example of faith. Just what we're talking about in verse 24. All things shall work together for your good if ye walk uprightly and remember the covenant wherewith ye have covenanted. What a hero. That's beautiful. Yep. We at Scripture Gems wholeheartedly endorse learning more about Vienna Jacques. And remember that she was also a diligent studier of the Scriptures, something else that we also heavily endorse. Yeah, her whole life. Well, let's go on to section 91. This is a revelation that Actually, Jay and I were really anxious to talk about. Yes. For the background, let's go to the section heading. This isn't something that we usually do, but this works really well here. The section heading of the section says, Revelation given through Joseph Smith the prophet at Kirtland, Ohio, March 9, 1833. The prophet was at this time engaged in the translation of the Old Testament, having come to that portion of the ancient writings called the Apocrypha. He inquired of the Lord and received this instruction. Well, let's just turn to the Apocrypha in our Bible, shall we? And oh, hey, where is it? Wait. Darn it, I don't have an Apocrypha. There was supposed to be an Apocrypha here. Yeah, where is the Apocrypha? And also, what is the Apocrypha? And why do we keep saying Apocrypha? Apocrypha! So have you ever wondered what the Apocrypha is? Well, wonder no longer. All right, you guys. I'll turn the time over to my brother Jay to tell you what it is. (laughs) You guys, you're going to love this. First of all, we need to know the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. The last books that were written date about 400 BC. When Alexander the Great conquered that region, he brought with him Western culture, which included the language of Greek. Soon, that was what most everyone, including the Jews outside of Jerusalem, were speaking. Many Jews lived outside of the holy city and could no longer read their scriptures. And so in Alexandria, which was a major hub of academic learning, a group of Jewish scholars translated the Hebrew Bible into Greek. This is called the Septuagint. Between the ending of the Hebrew Bible and the translation of the Septuagint, other books had been written in Greek. So the Septuagint included additional books that the Hebrew Bible did not have. These included additional stories about Daniel, additional chapters of Esther, wisdom writings, and most notably the history of the Maccabees, which helps fill in the history that connects the Old Testament with the New Testament. These additional books are called the Apocrypha. 
Some of the books contain wonderful testimonies of God's power and mercy. Some of the stories may be less edifying, but are still an enjoyable read. One example is the story of Daniel in Bell and the Dragon, in which Daniel uncovers the deception of the priests of King Cyrus of Persia, demonstrating that their gods were only idols. It's a fun story to read, but I don't know that I see a lot of spiritual value in it. The Septuagint was the Bible of Jesus' day. When the disciples quoted the Old Testament, they were quoting the Septuagint. The apocryphal books would have been part of their study, too. When the Jews later established their canon of scripture, meaning the books they considered authoritative, they only kept the books that were written in Hebrew. The Christians treasured all the books, including those that we call Apocrypha. They were part of the Christian Bible until their status began to be questioned during the Protestant Reformation of the 1500s. Still, all Protestant Bibles included the apocryphal books, including the authorized King James Version, although they were considered deuterocanonical or not at the same level of authority as the other 66 books. There's a pretentious word for you, deuterocanonical. <laughs> yeah. Practice that one. Basically, they were put into their own spot. Yep. Occasionally, there would be an edition of the Bible that would not include them, such as the Geneva Bible printings of 1599 and 1640. But it wasn't until 1825 when the British and Foreign Bible Society, in essence, threw down the gauntlet and said, these 66 books and no others. But most versions of the most popular Bible, that's the King James Version, continued to include the Apocrypha until 1885. So when Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery purchased a copy of the King James Version of the Bible on October 8, 1829 from E.B. Grandin in Palmyra, New York, for the purpose of making the inspired translation, this large pulpit-style edition contained the Old and New Testaments and the Apocrypha. Hmm. You can actually see that Bible here at the Joseph Smith Papers. I love that. You can that. find the link in the description. Now, that's really cool. I encourage you to take a look at that. It's the actual book. They've scanned every page and the cover and everything. So really cool. Neat. So from Revelations in Context, specifically the Joseph Smith's Bible translation article, it says, Joseph Smith soon came to a section in his King James Bible containing a collection of 14 books known as the Apocrypha. While most Bibles in Joseph Smith's day contained these books, there was a growing movement at the time that questioned their status as Scripture. Given this dispute, Joseph wanted to know if he should seek to translate the books and took the question to the Lord. And let's take a look at the Lord's answer. Verse 1, Verily thus saith the Lord unto you concerning the Apocrypha, There are many things contained therein that are true, and it is mostly translated correctly. There are many things contained therein that are not true, which are interpolations by the hands of men. Verily I say unto you that it is not needful that the Apocrypha should be translated. Therefore, whoso readeth it, let him understand, for the Spirit manifesteth truth. And whoso is enlightened by the Spirit shall obtain benefit therefrom. And whoso receiveth not by the Spirit cannot be benefited. Therefore, it is not needful that it should be translated. Amen. Well, there you go. Straightforward. Nice. The Bible Dictionary contains an entry titled Apocrypha, which provides a brief overview of each of the texts that often comprise the Apocrypha. And we'll put a link to that in the description. Absolutely. And if you want to start with one, I recommend the book of Susanna. It's short, but it's a wonderful story of standing up for virtue and truth even when forces are against you. It takes place during the time of the exile when the Jews have been taken into Babylon, and it features a young Daniel who follows the Spirit of God even against corrupt elders. And if you don't know where to find these books, you can find the apocryphal books in Bibles in your library or online. It's really easy. Just type in Apocrypha, and you'll easily find many different translations and versions of that. Not only that, but the Deseret Bookshelf app also has a free version in an ebook form of the Apocrypha. Oh, super. If you'd like to read that. That's great. But if you're interested in learning more about the Apocrypha and other extra biblical books, I recommend 
Between the Testaments, From Malachi to Matthew by Richard Neitzel Halsifel and S. Kent Brown. From the same authors, they also published a book called The Lost 500 Years, What Happened Between the Old and New Testaments. Both books are available at Deseret Book, and we don't get a commission, but they're good books. <laughs> Great. And let's conclude with a section from the Revelations in Context. Skipping that section, Joseph continued to labor over the Old Testament translation for several more months until, on July 2, 1833, a letter from the First Presidency, including Joseph Smith, Sidney Rigdon, and Frederick G. Williams, in Kirtland to the Saints in Zion, recorded that they, this day, finished the translating of the scriptures, for which we return gratitude to our Heavenly Father. Yay! That's fantastic. So, there you go. If they had to translate the Apocrypha, it probably would have taken them several months more. (laughs) But they're done. Yes. So, good for them. And so are we with Section 91. Let's move on to Section 92. This is a really short section, and we have a quick background from the Institute Manual, Frederick G. Williams was called on January 5, 1833, to replace Jesse Goss as a counselor in the presidency of the high priesthood. On March 15, 1833, the Lord directed that Brother Williams also become a member of the United Firm. This meant that he was to join the previously called nine members of the United Firm in managing the literary and mercantile operations of the church. So it's two verses long. If you don't have enough time to read this revelation, you got a time management problem. You got to yes. work on that. And we're not going to read the whole revelation, but I do want to point out a really key phrase in verse 2. You shall be a lively member in this order. What does that mean? What does that mean to you? What can you do to be a lively member of the church today? I think that would be a great discussion to have with your family and friends as you study this. What can we do to be a lively member? That's such a great word. It's so positive. Oh, yeah. Lively member of the church. Well, this has been amazing. What an amazing lesson. So many fun things to talk about. Yeah, I know this went a little bit long, you guys, but I mean, when do we get to really sit down and swim around in these waters? So it was really fun to do. Yes, thanks for joining us on this journey. And we look forward to talking to you about even more. Remember, all of the things that we have studied so far, including the revelations today, the church isn't even three years old yet. Wow. Three years old. So much has happened, and there's so much more to come. Keep reading your scriptures, and we'll look forward to talking to you more about it at our next lesson. We'll see you then. This podcast is not officially affiliated with The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But we're really big fans. (laughs) 